Hello, today is April 8th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus, and today we're privileged to have Joseph B. Alpers. Welcome, Joe. Thank you for coming. Happy to be here. May I ask you when and where you were born? In Salem, Mass, uh, on August 24th, 1925. And where do you currently live? In Natick on, on Lakeshore Road. How long have you lived in Natick? Uh, since 1961. Do you notice dramatic changes in the town between now the downtown, and then? The downtown surely has changed. Uh, a lot of it has stayed the same. And your marital status? Married. Do you have children? Uh, my wife has a daughter from her first marriage, whom I consider my daughter also. And, we, and uh, together we have a son. And do you have grandchildren? Uh, four, two adoptive and two natural. Where Biologic. And, right. Okay. Where and when did you enter the military? I entered the military uh, in Salem, uh, October '43, but actually, uh, actually, I reported to Fort Devens. And when you reported to Fort Devens, did you? Um, why did you? First of all, why did you join the service? Um, I didn't have to join because I had a heart murmur, but um, I had three brothers already serving, and I wanted to be there. And were you going into the army? Army. Why did you choose the army? Um, I never gave it another thought. Were your brothers in the army? Uh, Two were in the Army and one was in the Marines. Did friends join at the same time? Uh, not collectively. And did you do your basic training at Fort Devens? No. Uh, it was only there a couple of nights and was shipped immediately to um, Camp Shelby in Mississippi where I spent um, three months. Was this the first time you had ever been out of the New England area? I had been, um, I had hitchhiked to New York City to see a friend once. That's all I can think of. And uh, as a very young child, we had uh, put, uh, packed all of us into an old Buick and gone to Buffalo. I was maybe eight years old. Was it a family vacation? It was a family vacation. Tell us what Camp Shelby was like. Um, the weather was superb. I mean, I left oncoming winter in, the, in New England, and it was mild and lovely down there. Uh, it was enormous, and uh, we were thrown together uh, as a company in, in training. We joined uh, a few dozen uh, what we call cadre, C-A-D-R-E, who uh, had been in the Army previously for six to 12 months and were there to train us. But all of us joined that, the, the single battalion, the 245th Combat Engineers, which is what we served with the entire remainder of our time in the Army. Now, why do you think you went into combat engineering? Was it just a fluke? It was my turn to be in combat engineers. And did you have any special training for that? Not for that, but during it, uh, after about February, they shipped me off to um, Camp, um, the Signal Corps camp in um, New Jersey. I'll have to think of. Not Fort Dix. No. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll have to think of it. Okay. And uh, I was there longer than I should have been because I had my tonsils out and had a severe uh, hemorrhage and had to stay there for many months recovering. But at, after which time, 
D-Day had occurred, uh, and by, that was in June, and in October, uh, they shipped me back to my company in uh, Camp Shelby, who had spent the summer in Tennessee on maneuvers, and I missed all that. But I rejoined the company. But since I had gone for radio training, I now uh, left the line company uh, uh, and uh, joined the headquarters, comp headquarters uh, platoon, rather, I left the line platoon and joined the headquarters platoon of, of, my, uh, of my C company. And why was that? Why do you think you, what was the difference between well, the line company the, and the headquarters? Well, I was chosen by a very nice guy who sort of, he was a much older person. He was in his late 30s and we trained together in basic training and he just uh, thought that I'd be qualified to be a, a radio operator. And I think he also uh, thought it would be nice if he got me out of, uh, out of line duty. <laughs> was line duty considered infantry or...? No, it was combat engineers, which was building bridges, repairing bridges, clearing minefields. So how long at... You, this was October then of 44? I rejoined them in October 44, and on November 10th we shipped out to England. So I had to... Uh, complete the checklist of things that you have to accomplish in order to go overseas, which included uh, crawling on your belly under live bullets, and uh, and then going off in the in the woods uh, alone with maybe one other buddy and uh, uh, reacting to quote enemy fire and so forth. How did you get over to England? Did you go by boat? On a Liberty ship, yeah. What was that like? It was um, interesting. Uh, it was uh, much more, it happened to be much more peaceful than coming home on a Liberty ship, which was, which I got violently ill from the weather. But um, you know, we were all pretty apprehensive, but also gung-ho for uh, arriving in England. We knew that we would be staged in England and that we might have an uh, interesting time there for a few weeks, which is exactly what happened. Tell us about some of that time. Was it free time for you to...? Not really free. Uh, occasionally we could. We were free to take walks or something like that. But we, uh, uh, and some of the guys hooked up with the local ladies. But um, we lived uh, in improvised quarters on an on a abandoned golf course uh, in a place called Sea Mills. And it was very near a very famous landmark, the, uh, a suspension bridge near Bristol. And we would uh, at least weekly hike to that bridge as a, you know, in formation as a company. And, uh, and when there were also some ancient ruins around where we lived. There were Roman ruins that we could investigate a little bit. So it was altogether sort of uh, interesting, and the, uh, the local people were very nice. Did you see a lot of devastation because England had been uh, pretty Only, uh, yes, when I took a few days leave in London. Uh, there was a lot of bombing there, uh, but um, not in the countryside. I also visited some friends in Liverpool. The daughter had been briefly evacuated to the U.S. and she was back now. And we, we had a nice time in, in Liverpool. We took bikes around the city and uh, went to a party. How long were you in England? Uh, we arrived in mid-November and uh, shipped out on Christmas Day from Southampton. We went to uh, France, uh, down the Seine, and we overnighted it in Rouen, which was the coldest night of my life, I think. Very, very cold. And you were outside? We were in tents in Rouen. It was very, it was very uh, freezing. What was your... Um 
clothing, your boots, were they appropriate for that type Not of weather? Not really. I froze my toes, actually, in the wall, and then charred my shoes at the fire. We'll get to the fire, I think. What's that? Will we get to the fire? No, the fire was just a little uh, wood fire that they that we improvised to keep warm, but I put my toes to it. I was so cold. and I charred, Too close. I, I charred my, my toes, my, my shoes. So you're in France. How did you get from England to France? A boat. Boat. What was going on? Were you hearing anything? Well, D-Day was already war? over. The channel was pretty much under a lot of control, and uh, we did some marching to get, you know, for a few miles to get onto the boat from where they left us off. And I, I remember one of our company, one of the oldest guys in the company. I just, it's just something that sticks in my mind. The, 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 the local people came out to see us and to wish us well. And he gave this kid a vicious kick. He said, I hate kids. Oh. <laughs> that probably didn't go over too well with the locals. In general, we did. Yeah. Yeah. So did you know where you were going? No, that was all pretty much a secret. Right. And what happened? Well, we were in France for the better part of a month before we were committed to action. And that was at the front near Metz, which is one of the major cities of Lorraine, of Alsace-Lorraine. And it's a part of, part of France that had turned over several times between France and Germany. And most recently in 1870, it had been taken over by the Germans. And the people there really were very confused as to what they were because they had been, kids had been learning German in school. And, uh, but they were in France. It was now France because mm -hmm. it had been liberated by us. And, uh, and the people, I guess, basically preferred to be French. And they spoke a patois that uh, they referred to as Luxembourgeois. And uh, so January 21st, I believe, uh, can be confirmed in the book. Uh, we were committed to action in the region of France. Typically, we were uh, a free-floating company, and we were attached to uh, various uh, larger groups uh, that were in combat, and uh, mostly we were associated, attached to uh, sections that belonged to uh, Patton's Third Army. So that we served under the Third Army during almost all the time we were in, uh, we were in Europe, but, it was, but we were an independent uh, battalion. Battalion is uh, six, seven hundred men, uh, four companies. And um, so when we were committed in Metz, committed to action near Metz, I believe January 21st, uh, it was to back up a particular uh, entity in the Third Army. And um, we were housed not in tents but in abandoned apartments. And uh, when you asked in the questionnaire about things that stood out in my mind, uh, certainly that did, because um, that first night, when we were just uh, getting settled for the night in this rather decrepit, abandoned apartment, some of our men came returning from their assignment, and Pat yells out, they got Seer, they got Seer, that's C-Y-R, and by which he meant that they had been on a little expedition and Seer had been killed on their very first night out. And uh, that was, of course, devastating to everybody. Uh, others were wounded, Seer was hit by an enemy bullet, and that's the last we heard of Pat because he really lost his uh, emo emotional control after, uh, after that night. And uh, 
I never saw any further of him. He probably was uh, brought back to some kind of medical uh, situation, psychiatric. Do you get the impression, looking back, that you weren't aware of the danger at that time? Or? Well, you know, like all people in the Army, you don't think you're going to get it. You, you are personally immune. And then when it happens? When it happens, you, it, it strikes with a lot of, uh, you know, reality uh, and, and, uh, and emotion. But um, um, I don't recall precisely what their expedition was that night, the platoon that Pat and Sear had been on. They were either clearing mines or repairing a bridge somewhere. Typically, we followed the units at the front to which we were attached. We followed them by a half a day to a day and a half. So we were supposed to get into an area that was cleared of enemy fire uh, if not of mines and so forth, uh, and it needed it needed work. It needed uh, to have uh, bridges restored and what have you. Uh, but so in that case, you figure well, we're not out there personally to kill. If you keep your nose clean and you remember how to clear a mine, you'll probably be all right. But we had a number of people who shot up in the course of the next several months in France, uh, clearing minefields. Did you have training in clearing minefields? Yes, they gave that. I missed a lot of it. Uh, I, I saw some of it, but I missed a lot of it by being up at Fort Monmouth, was the place in New Jersey. In New Jersey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At Fort Monmouth, I, uh, there I was there for radio school, and they were on, on, uh, they were on uh, the whole company, the whole battalion was on maneuvers and they uh, reinforced a lot of the uh, more, uh, more uh, elementary things that uh, they'd learned the, the months before at Shelby. So you're backing up the Third Army. Yeah, units of the Third Army, you know, individual units, right. And were you hearing about their casualties also? Um, Not frequently. We um, mostly we were receiving orders, uh, and I, because I was in the radio uh, field, we we I either got it by radio uh, wire uh, or um, or telephone, uh, and would transmit this to our commanding officer, but. Uh, the things that I recall were primarily orders of where to go next and to some extent where we would be relative to the other companies of our battalion, A, B, A and B company, uh, so that we wouldn't uh, step on their toes. And you were C company? We were C company. As the radio man, yeah. were you in the front line? Were you in the back with the commanders? Mostly in back with the, with the um, uh, so-called headquarters platoon, which included the commanding officer of our company, a captain, and the first sergeant, uh, and uh, m manning the radios and the phones for them. Uh, there were three of us, uh, and a company clerk. And um, there were a few occasions when we were in advance of the, of the others because I, I uh, using my Yiddish, I passed as the company translator for German. And uh, so I would often be responsible, usually be responsible for finding a place to stay for the company for the night, uh, which meant evicting people from their apartments and houses and uh, getting our guys installed there for the night or several nights. And uh, sometimes that involved uh, going on ahead of where they were working. And uh, on at least one occasion, it, was, it turned out to be uh, 
a little bit chancy because we were, I was with the first sergeant in a jeep and we were investigating a place to stay for the night and it was two o'clock in the afternoon perhaps. So we had to really move it. And uh, we were on a hillside on a road with very, very few dwellings on it. And we got out of the jeep to investigate. And next thing you know, we were the, the uh, objective of some artillery fire from across the way. And they were really zeroing in on us, on our, our jeep and us. And we really peeled out of there in a hurry, I'll tell you, right? In the jeep, or did the jeep in get the jeep, yeah, mm -hmm. In the jeep, yeah, in the jeep, yeah. So we, you we, were... You I mean, were... Yeah, but that was not the usual thing. Usually we were, uh, you know, a few hundred yards or half a mile behind the rest of the company. But on, on, uh, as, on a few occasions we were, we were looking for, for billets, as we call them, uh, in advance of the company. How old were you at this time? Nineteen. Did this kind of open your eyes to the realities of war, what you were seeing and experiencing? Yeah, I had very, um, I was very conflicted about the war because in a few weeks we were within Germany and uh, I was confronting the German people again for needing things that we needed to provide for ourselves. And I was often struck, I said, how do these people compare with my mother? How would she respond? And it was very difficult for me. I, uh, I felt that a lot of them were very ordinary folks who, were, who had been subjected to a lot of stuff. And so I, uh, of course you met all kinds of people, some of them very hypocritical, but, um, I really uh, got to feel that all people are pretty much the same. Do you think others in your company felt I that way? I never discussed it with them, and I don't think they did feel that. I think uh, hate, uh, hate was the major emotion. Hate for the Germans? Yeah. They didn't want to be there. They, uh, they thought the Germans were, you know, I think that they rightfully thought that the, the Germans had, had begun this terrible mess that we're all in. Uh, risking our lives. Uh, so you went from France into Germany. Yeah, uh, we we were uh, stalled quite a bit in France. That that was uh, a stalled period from mid January to about two months, and um, we stayed maybe two or three weeks in one little one horse town where we stayed up in a, a loft in a barn, four of us, and... Um, were you hiding out? Were you... No, we were, we were billeted there. That's mm -hmm. where we were billeted. And uh, we, we pulled guard duty and office duty and uh, talked to the guys who came back from the minefields. During that period, one of our really favorite lieutenants lost a leg in a minefield and that it was devastating to everybody. Others were killed that same night. So uh, it was it was it was a a dangerous period, but it was a stalled period because the the front line wasn't going anywhere for a couple of months. And then quickly it began to move, and we moved over the Rhine on a pontoon bridge. Not one that we had put up, but that had been put up by another company. And I'll never forget that night, because uh, we, we crossed the Rhine at night. And in the morning, I saw my first dead soldier, a, a dead German in a foxhole, and he was maybe my age. And, I mean, he, it was... It was very upsetting to me to see him. Yeah, because he was abandoned there, dead. His uh, 
people had not had a chance to retrieve his body. And it was a very emotional moment for me. But the worst thing that night is that one of the mysteries of our whole time in Europe, which was that there was an accident in our company. One of a, a kid my own age or a few months older was killed by a rifle shot from his own rifle. And it was never explained to us how this happened. It was just called an accident. Uh, the idea of suicide never occurred to anybody. He was a, a happy-go-lucky kid. He was a fine kid, a southern, tall, beautiful kid. And uh, it was, for some reason, the incident was brushed off. And we heard very little about it. It was never explained. No one even talked about it very much. Looking back, though, do you think they didn't talk about it because they didn't want to get you all down even more than perhaps That's you possible. Were? That's possible. It's possible that they found out something about it that was, uh, that was unattractive. Uh, I have no idea what the reason for the quiet was, but it was as if nothing had happened. So that was uh, a little dose of reality that snuck in. And then from that time, the once we turned the cover of the Rhine, we couldn't keep up fast enough with the front. We were, every night we were in a different place, heading east almost as far as Dresden and then south into Bavaria and witnessing uh, enormous numbers of POWs uh, uh, throwing away their arms and... Uh, German POWs. Ger German POWs throwing away their arms and giving up to us, and they were kids, they were 15, 16 years old, many of them, and the war was all but over. We're talking about, you know, April already. The war had another, officially another month to go uh, before it was over. And uh, uh, this was a, a more easygoing part of the war. We were moving very fast. Uh, I had a lot to do because I had to find find uh, billets every night, practically, in a different place. But uh, there, there was not much by way of danger. And the things that our company were doing, uh, they were uh, more selective because, they, they, uh, because there was very little opposition. They could choose very, uh, the upper headquarters, Patton and company, could choose which bridges and which minefields uh, to take care of, not all of them, because we weren't contesting all of them. We just needed to push ahead. So uh, it made things a lot easier and quicker. Did you ever see Patton? No. Did, did. you hear about him? In oh, yeah. Circuit? We heard about him a lot. What kind of things were you hearing about well, him? Well, he was very effective, mean and rotten, but effective. Right? And yeah. did some of your commanding officers have any? Uh, maybe the, the um, lieutenant colonel, uh, the colonel who was in charge of the battalion, possibly met with him. I never asked that question. I never got to know him until recently uh, at some of our reunions uh, when uh, he and I struck up some conversations. He was, you know, 10 or 15 years older than I was. And when I was a when I was a recruit, uh, I mean, he was God. Uh, there was, I, was, I was in fear and trembling. Now, this uh, is the, your commanding the, officer? The, the, or the, the colonel the of the colonel. battalion. Okay. Yeah. Well, the commanding officer was a captain who was a wonderful man. He was just... Uh, they, they both had been, and this is an interesting thing, they both had been in real life civil engineers who had been conscripted to run a combat engineer battalion. They knew nothing of combat, except that, you know, they did some ROTC probably uh, during college in order to make the, they were both, especially uh, Livingston, who was the, um, the battalion commander, the big commander, he was, I understand, 
He grew up dirt poor, and he made his way through college through with ROTC. But, you know, you don't learn how to be a commander of 600 or 700 men in ROTC. And uh, so he rose to the occasion of uh, running this uh, in combat, uh, accepting casualties and being responsible for them. So he was a good leader? I think he was not immensely respected. I respected him a great deal, and I thought he was an okay leader. But I think the people closest to him felt that he was hollow. How old? You said about 15 years older than you. So in his well, he early just 30s, died. maybe? He died uh, two years ago at age 93. So during this time, as you said, things really... He, the, the, heated up and the, you were really you were somewhere moving, different every, every single night, night. Right. and were you hearing about what the third army was well we knew that through? the war was run was we could see from the behavior of the germans that we were encountering that the war was coming to an end and uh, we I, we would get occasional issues of the stars and stripes which was the local newspaper and uh, and that would sort of uh, give uh, uh, some kind of rosy picture uh, of the war and also uh, of the uh, difficulties that uh, the German high command was experiencing with uh, trying to overthrow Hitler and all those kind of stuff. Now when you mention a rosy picture, to you it wasn't rosy. You were having well, weather issues and... Yeah, right. We, uh, we were continuously having to deal with prisoners, with suspect individuals that we were meeting. I mean, we were moving along. There was not a lot of, uh, a lot of um, visible opposition, uh, but there could be surreptitious opposition, and we had to deal with that. Did you have, besides the Jeep incident, did you have other close calls? Um, that was the the most, uh, the most, uh, uh, because I was really favored not to be with a line with a line uh, platoon. Right. What was your rank at that time? At that time, I was uh, T four, which is a, 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 a corporal technician. I was discharged as a three four, which is a sergeant technician. During your time with the Army and going into France and into Germany, did you have any air or any air support? Uh, that was nothing we ever needed. It never came up that I knew. Seeing some of the injur injuries that you mentioned, do you feel that there was a quality of medical care that that the um, well the first line of medical care was provided by people that we knew personally in the headquarters company of the battalion there was a medical unit and they were there and they would refer uh, people behind the lines as necessary to uh, to uh, uh, deeper care but they were, they were really very good. They were, uh, uh, These would be medics and yeah, others? Well, a couple of captains and uh, maybe half a dozen medics. Right. Once you got over the Rhine, where did it all end for you? What happened? Well, as I said, we moved quickly eastward and then south. You said close and to Dresden. We, we had ended in Braunau in, uh, in Austria. Uh, we were in Austria when, when, um, when uh, peace was declared. And we were within, uh, actually in a place called Atnang, we were within five miles of one of the worst concentration camps. And some of our men went to those places and saw came back with the stories and some pictures. I didn't bring those pictures with me. Uh, the, the pictures that you're quite familiar with of corpses and near corpses and so forth. And it was something. I did visit there 
a few days later. What was the name of the camp? Do you remember? Uh, Marthausen. Marthausen. Yeah. And uh, I did visit there a few, uh, a few days later after, the, after they, uh, there had been a lot of cleanup already. Uh, and uh, the typical thing about it is that the people nearby, although they could hear the stench from the chimneys, they could smell the stench from the chimneys, uh, claimed to know nothing about the existence of the camp. That, that was pretty amazing. Prior to hearing about it and then seeing it, had you heard about the camps as yes, the war yes, went Yes, I on? think we had heard about it before we left the States. I'm quite sure. And you mentioned Yiddish, so being a part of the Jewish faith and going over there, and, and, and had you heard prior to going over that the camps were specific for sure, members sure. of your own. Right. What was that like for you? Well, it was what, what you might imagine. It was, I mean, not only that, my father had lost a couple of sisters there and their families. Um, I mean, it was, it was highly personal. But um, the, uh, it's strange that the, the people who are, with whom I spoke Yiddish, uh, they understood that I was talking some corrupt kind of language just to get anything across to them to let us have whatever, or whatever it was we needed. Uh, they were very, uh, very well behaved because I think they were afraid to behave otherwise. They understood uh, what I was. I made no bones about it. Right. Uh, when you went into the camp, were many of the... Um, most of the survivors had either drifted away or been taken away in trucks or something like that. There were very few survivors walking around when I went into the camp. There were still... There were still uh, and uh, most of the, of the corpse material had been removed. Um, it was. Um, what but, was it I mean, like the, for the, you? the outlines of the camp were clear, right? Were you able to speak to any of the prisoners that were in there, or the? Um... No, I don't recall doing that. Right. How did it affect you? Well, uh. I guess very deeply, but um, I was sort of expecting it, so maybe not as deeply as if it had come as a surprise. Uh, I had seen pictures. Prior to going in. Yeah. Had the pictures stunned you and your oh, yeah. other? Oh yeah, the pictures were astonishing. So having seen them ahead of time, yeah you were more or less prepared? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Seeing the camp, and see, tell us what it was like. What were the living conditions like? Were there areas? We didn't go inside any structures, mm -hmm. um, but we saw that the ovens were there, were here, and the so-called barracks were here. I mean, we were there very briefly. And you knew what the ovens were all about? Oh, yeah. This, after you saw the, the camps and they were liberated, how much longer did you have to stay in that area? Not long, another day or two maybe. We moved from there to another part of Austria where they needed, it was actually the birthplace of Hitler, Braunau, where uh, uh, we were building a bridge across the Inn River. And then we went from there to another, to another uh, site further west, which also involved an even larger bridge over the Inn River. So we had things like that to do uh, as assignments. Uh, so even though the war was, war was over, over, you war still, over. your work was not... That's right. Well, no, that's right. And we remained there this summer, as I said, in a sort of idyllic, circumstance in a town with maybe 50 houses and a beautiful pond and a castle. But um, 
it, uh, it was um, interrupted myself. Um, but you mentioned having to build bridges. We put up Bailey Bridges. What's a Bailey Bridge? Bailey Bridge is a prefab metal bridge. So how with sections? How did you carry all that on trucks or? The, the material came on trucks and it was lifted off the trucks with manpower. And there would be double baileys and double double baileys. Double would be uh, not a single span high, but two spans high, and a double double would be side by side sections, which gave much more reinforcement. But the, of course, the thing about the baileys is you can push you push the, the sections out as you keep adding them. But the the big thing is to make the approaches that uh, that will be uh, that will fit the bridge to the landscape and make it possible for trucks. Typically, how long did it take to make a bridge? Baileys could go up in a few days. If it was a double-double, it would take a week and a half. But, uh, and it was the approaches that took a lot of time. Were these permanent or temporary? No, they're temporary structures. But like all temporary structures, they have a way of becoming permanent. Ask any veteran. Right? Sure, <laughs> sure. So you're in this area in Austria, even though you had the duty to build these bridges, did you also have a more relaxed atmosphere? Oh yeah, the war was over. Yeah. But of course there was another fear, which is next Japan. And uh, all of us were very aware that uh, as soon as uh, the coast was clear here, uh, we would be packed up, go back to the States for a trip to Japan and to finish the war there. And of course, it came to us as very welcome news at the time in August that uh, the Japanese war was over. Had you heard we anything? Fully, we fully expected to go there. You did. And you hadn't heard anything prior to the bombing of. No, uh, 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 about the atom bomb? Right. No. You heard nothing about that. No. When you heard about the devastation in Japan, how did that affect you and your other... Relief. Mm -hmm. Relief that it was over? Relief that over we didn't have to go? Over for us. We would not have to go to Japan. I mean, in retrospect, that was a very shallow view, but that's uh, what it was like. Well, you had been through so much, so yeah. many of you. We had a, we had a, a nice summer, though. This, this uh, lake, Seon, was nice. The, our, our guys who could build anything, they built a shower arrangement down by the lake. And I made all the billets in town. I, you know, I arranged them. And there was a guest house in the middle of town. Uh, uh, that had been there for maybe hundreds of years, the guest house. It was the kind of place that had like a ballroom upstairs and in the basement was the most extraordinary thing, which I guess is not that unusual, but a insulated area where they cut ice off the lake in the winter and had kept it in the basement of the hotel and they had ice all summer mm. from that. And is that where you stayed? Or? I stayed in a very in a nice chalet type house. But the guest house was also for the guest house was for our men. We had twenty to twenty four men there in a kind of dormitory arrangement on the in the ballroom. However, mystery death number two occurred up there uh, in August, just before the Japan news. Louis L., who had been on loan, he was an accordion player, a very good one, but on loan to another outfit 
that needed a musician sure in the months after the war and he came back to us and rejoined his men that he'd been with for two years and one morning he woke up dead in the ballroom of the guest house and that also was never explained had he been shot or do you even no, know? No, he had a natural death. Could have been a heart attack. It could have been a case of poisoning. It could have been a lot of things that don't leave wounds. But that, that and the, when you talk about things you remember, I remember that death the night we crossed the Rhine just because it was, you know, it was what you would call unnecessary. I mean, it was a gratuitous, terrible thing, and so was this. And uh, no one ever explained it to me. Well, things like this may happen in civilian life too, but uh, it was, uh, I, I was very taken aback by it. Do you feel, looking at your group, many of them your age, that you weren't as hardened as some of the others? Oh, that's absolutely true. And that's one of the reasons that the, the sergeant who sent me to radio school did so. He thought I'd do better in a non-combatant uh, uh, setting. But... Um, you want to talk about people in the, in the outfit, there are two guys that really stand out to me, and they weren't guys that I knew very well. They're just guys that I observed. Basically, we were two kinds of people, uh, young and old. The young were 18 and 19, and the older ones were 35. Everything in between had already gone off to the war. And there was one guy who was an older guy from backwoods of Maine, well built, not tall, good looking. He was, to my mind, the most amazing person I've ever met in terms of his capability. He probably he was lucky if he had a high school education. But his native intelligence and his ability to sum up situations and to, and to meet them was so impressive, so outstanding, I'll never forget him. He never attended any of our reunions. And uh, he was, he rose there from being, you know, a buck private to being uh, a sergeant in charge of a balloon and a platoon, and then a staff sergeant in, uh, in charge of the. Uh, I'm sorry, a sergeant in charge of a squad of a dozen men, and then a staff sergeant in charge of a platoon of three dozen men. And um, I mean, I, he just taught me something about the nature of uh, native intelligence and the, uh, how that should not be confused with education. And, uh, and training. He was just, he just had it. What about the second one? The other one. to think who that was. I had someone else in mind. Who was it? You said there were two individuals yes, that you and, observed. Right, and I'm trying to think of the second one whom I 
was prepared to talk about today. Well, thinking back, it might come to you. Um, you mentioned that you were a T4, is that what it was, when you... It was discharged, was discharged. Right. When and where were you discharged? Port Devons. So you came back after the summer. Did you take a ship back? I came back in April. April? 46. Oh. So you were over there for quite a while after the war. War ended in April 45. I came over in April 46. So during that period of time, were you continuing to help with rebuilding? Um, from September or so, our company was disbanded. And we were sent hither and yon. Actually, I'm exaggerating. We, we, we went into the fall to various parts of Bavaria, near Ulm and so forth, uh, for, for periods of a few weeks. But then, by the winter, we were disbanded. And uh, we were, you know, entering the pipeline one way or another, the pipeline home. And uh, according to various criteria having to do with your military experience and your age and other things as the priority that you had in the pipeline. So I, I was in the uh, region of Munich uh, for several weeks waiting to enter the pipeline and we got on a boat in Bremen. We were southeast of Munich for the summer in a small town and um, it was um, a very attractive location, you know, a, a pretty mountain town, it was very pretty, with a lake. And uh, about once a week, I would go into Munich on shopping expeditions for the company to buy various things and to arrange for various things, because we were, we were assigned, our assignment during that period for most of the summer was to build camps for the displaced persons. Displaced from their homes? Yeah, DPs from other parts of Europe who were slave laborers in Germany and this kind of thing. And the, the Germany was crawling with these people who, who were displaced from their own countries. And uh, we built places for them to live. Now, when you and I, I had to arrange to get the lumber and the other materials. So going in also to Munich to shop, besides the lumber and other materials, what else would you have to purchase? I would have to purchase dental gold for the first sergeant's tooth repairs that were being done in the town. Seriously? Seriously. Were they being done by a local dentist? Local dentist, right. And they found that it was necessary or cheaper. Well, he, to do he that? took the opportunity to get these, to get a, a lot of this fairly nice work done on himself for cigarettes, you know. So I would, uh, I would find the places that had the special dental gold, and uh, that was one of the things that I did. Uh, Other, you know, I would imagine, for example, although I didn't do it, that a book like that was probably published in Munich. And May you it, might mention the book, even though we're not showing it on camera, the book. Sure. That, talk about what it well, is. Well, the book was uh, a book like a yearbook published uh, by the battalion, company by company, in the, in the course of the summer, with uh, pictures arranged for individual photographs of all the people in the battalion, company by company, and then pictures of their athletics that summer and stuff like that. Uh, other interesting f shots of the building sites, the, the bridge building sites that we were involved in and so forth. Uh, 
and there was a, it was uh, written by uh, people in the various companies who uh, did a very good job, really, summarizing the uh, affairs of the group, both building up to that summer from the time we hit. Actually, it goes back to the founding of the company in the fall of 43 and uh, follows them through maneuvers in uh, Tennessee and then, and then uh, in the Bristol area in Germany and then committed to action on the continent. And it, uh, it gives all of the details of where they spent every night. So it's a real history. It's a history. So this was the 245th Combat, Combat Engineering Battalion, Battalion, and it was companies A, B, and C. C and headquarters. And headquarters, and you were with the C company. That's right. When did you hear you were coming home? Uh, we knew we were coming home once we heard about the atomic bomb. But I mean, when did you personally hear? You well, said then, you were in the pipeline. We, we got in the pipeline, and uh, uh, so I was in Munich, stationed in an ex concentration camp on the road to Dachau, uh, a lesser camp than Dachau. They converted it into barracks for the pipeline. And I would hitchhike into Munich uh, 10 miles every day and have a very nice time. I saw some wonder, I saw opera and I saw some symphony that was being revived then by the Germans that summer. I mean, it was the following spring after hostilities, a year after the war is over. And uh, there were movies for the GIs. I went to, I'll never forget the movie that I saw that really made me f anxious to get home, which was State Fair. You saw that overseas? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was great. So then coming home, did you come home on another victory ship or? I, it was a victory ship. It was uh, a, a ride with terrible weather during which I prayed to die. You had mentioned in the early part of this going over, it was fine. wasn't that bad. Was yeah. it because of the weather and high seas? Yeah, and the weather you... was just, or maybe the part of the ocean we were in, but uh, that other trip in November you'd think would be worse, but it was uh, not all that uncomfortable. But the trip coming home in April was a terrible challenge. I, for days at a time, I, I lay down in my hammock or whatever they gave us down there and ate two lawn of dunes the whole day. It was just terrible. Because you were sick. Yeah. And I have a very um, susceptible autonomic nervous system. I get, uh, I mean, uh, if I go on a, uh, if I go on a roller coaster, I'm practically dead. So you really felt. It was terrible. How long were you at sea? Oh. Seven, eight days, probably. And did you come into New York? To New York. Did your family know you were coming home? I don't remember. My mother and brother did meet me a few days later at Fort Devens, but I probably called them from New York City. What were your feelings about coming home? It was the happiest time of my life. Life was beginning. Everything was possible. You, you could be what you wanted to be. It was like your life was starting over again. I can't remember ever a period of such personal liberation as that. Do you think it's because of the horrors that you had seen that you just felt such I a I think it's just the circumstances. You know, um, even outside of war, you're never so carefree as when you are just left a job and have two other jobs in your pocket. Or you just finished school and you're about to conquer the job market. It's, uh, it's a feeling of great expectation and liberation. And so I don't think it had that much to do necessarily with the
the experiences, as, as with the unlimited prospects of the future. When you came home, did you discuss with your family or friends any of the circumstances that you were involved with overseas? Almost not at all. Did you join any unit of the military reserve? Not the reserve. The only thing I did is, starting about 25 years ago, we started having reunions. Where were they? Different parts of the country? Uh, different parts of them. We, we, we alternated between the north and the south because the company was comprised of about half north and half south. But the southern contingents were the more loyal to the, to the, uh, to the circumstances, and they were uh, also, they, it was easier for them to get to. They tended to have uh, less means than the northern people for travel. Oh, I remembered who the other guy was. Tell us about the other gentleman. The other guy was also a guy that I didn't know that well. I knew him a lot better than I knew the first one I told you about who was in a totally separate platoon, and I just observed him. Captain Summers, which is S, I guess S-U-M-M-E-R-S, -M -M -E uh, gave me my basic training. He was a staff sergeant in charge of the platoon, and he was part of the cadre that was there to train us when we arrived. Now, you said captain or staff sergeant? Staff sergeant. Okay. He was from the hills of Tennessee or maybe Carolina. He didn't have that much education, possibly finished high school. He was everything you would expect your sergeant to be, tall, strong, stern, fair. He wasn't as resourceful as the first guy. Uh, his name was Breton. The first guy was a French-Canadian named Breton, B-R-E-T-O-N, the first one. He, he wasn't resourceful like that. He wasn't brilliant. But to me, he represented the Army, although he'd been in the Army maybe, if a year more than us, it was a lot. But he, he represented the Army from every point of view, especially obedience, but also disobedience. When it came, because his attitude toward the officer corps was one where he would sort of laugh behind his wrist at some of their stupidities or foolishness, but not out loud so that he could be quoted by us. But he would not tolerate any uh, abuses by them or orders by them that were really contrary to the good of the outfit. He gave us a lot of practical advice on how to keep our ourselves um, fit and clean uh, during circumstances that don't particularly lend themselves to that. Uh, and he was just, to me, he was the army. So he obviously left an important... Left an impression on me. Impression on uh, me. Because he was, I never saw him do anything mean. I never saw him other than stern. He was always stern, but never mean. And... Uh, and he understood the ins and outs of the army and how the chain of command works. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So he, le he left an impression on me. Strangely, the follow-up on him 
He never came to a single reunion. And he stayed up in the hills with his mother. Never married or that you never know Never married. Of? Stayed up in the hills with his mother. I have no idea how he earned a living. A lot of the guys, when they left our company, earned a living as contractors and owning truck companies because a lot of the combat engineers has to do with a motor pool and transporting men and equipment around. And they became, you know, uh, not necessarily wealthy, but comfortable people with that which they learned in the Army of how to, how to manage a large operation, how to, how to manage an operation. And what about you? Did you use any of the GI Bill? Yes, I did. I used it primarily to go to medical school. Uh, I started using it in college, then I realized that the tuition in medical school would be a little higher, so I stopped the college benefit and I saved three years of it for medical school. And did you finish your career in medical school? Yes. And what was your specialty? I uh, went on after that for a PhD in biochemistry, and uh, I ran the diagnostic laboratories at Children's Hospital in Boston. For how long? Twenty odd years. How important to you was serving in the military? Um, it was very important. I, um, I think I learned a lot about people, how they react, what makes them tick, how to, how to, uh, get them to respond to you. And uh, I learned a lot about uh, sticking with a goal and I think uh, one of the most important lessons for me was uh, observing Breton to understand the, the value of native, native intelligence and uh, almost Streetwise, or in his well, case, yeah, except rural. That, except he was very elegant. Mm -hmm. He was just a country hick, but he he was elegant. I mean, he was there was no, there was nothing crude about him. Mm -hmm. In terms, I mean, when you say streetwise, it wasn't like that. Okay. Uh, he was uh, he was very gentlemanly, which also I think was a kind of natural uh, a natural uh, attribute of his. Looking back on this, uh, do you also feel in some way it affected your life, your experiences in the service? Uh, uh, that what did? Your experiences in the service, that uh, uh, they affected uh, uh, your life? My life? I know you had mentioned earlier about sticking with goals and yeah, things like yeah, that, so... Yeah. Well, I think... I don't know how much to attribute it to the uh, experiences of the service or just to my nature or my prior upbringing, uh, but... Um, I um, I think I have a patience that I might not have. Uh, well, th there's this in particular. In the army, you spend 
your whole life waiting, waiting for this, waiting for that. And you swear that when you get out, I did anyway, I would never waste another minute of my time. And did that happen? Whether it was from the army or from my general tendency to OCD, it's, it's the way I am. So I, I don't waste a lot of time. I, uh, when I'm having a snack, I'm reading. When I'm watching TV, I have something to read during the commercials. Um, I, um, I like to account for most of my time, almost all of it. And I think that, that surely that fit in with my experience as a GI of a, that I swore I would never waste another minute once I got out of that, that the army where you waste years waiting for something to happen. So that fit in well with my, with my own compulsions. Is there anything that you'd like to finish this interview with, a comment? A or smile. A smile. Right. We'd like to see yeah. a smile. Yeah. Um, I think it's very nice that you guys are doing this. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I sincerely hope that uh, the majority of them are a little more, a little more uh, generally helpful than my own is, but uh, I suspect that they are. Uh, the thing about the army that I should say. I should have used it to answer several of the questions you've recently asked. What I really loved about basic training those 13 weeks at Camp Shelby, which were absolute terror. What I really liked about them was the attitudes of the other people. We were all very different. We tolerated each other extremely well with the attitude, look, we're all in this together. The uh, opportunities for humor were rampant. I mean, these guys, you know, would, would uh, discover how to uh, make something funny about just, just about every circumstance. And uh, that taught me a great deal. Um, this was also true when we got out of the service at the um, at the reunions, everyone was treated equally. Uh, their previous history or even behavior, because there, there were a couple of uh, very uh, questionable bad apples in the group, but even their behavior was not held against them. They were just accepted as part of the group, and the group Again, we're very, uh, very nice to each other, very collegial, and uh, they were all so just so glad to see everybody else that there was no such thing as uh, hard feelings. And um, so I think the the um, the. aptitude that they had for making the best of a tough time 
was a tremendous lesson for me. They, uh, they, they could find a joke in almost everything. Well, Joseph B. Alpers, I want to thank you. Your remembrances are very, very important to this project that we do, and I want to thank you for coming in today. It was very, very nice to be with you, Joan. Thank you. Right.